not much hope of you guys coming back to campus next semester as well. So uh, that's life. Anyway, um, so let's you know start. Um, we are now moving towards some of those uh, you know uh, very nice uh, but advanced careers of you know linear algebra and foundations of data science, right? Uh, in the sense that. Today, what we are going to talk about are orthonormal bases. Okay. Um, and a very useful tool to create an orthonormal basis. Okay, and we'll just you know touch base upon where these orthonormal bases are used, right? So in that sense, I mean, you would recall that we had a pretty comprehensive discussion on change of basis matrix, right? We had a pretty comprehensive discussion on change of basis, okay? And we have seen that certain matrices, because of their special properties, could be written as a decomposition of three other matrices, um, two of which are orthonormal to each other, and the middle one is a diagonal matrix. Right? I mean, you, you can do so by uh, basically uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that we have a matrix C, and I should be able to write it as PDP inverse if there are certain properties of C that holds good, and if you know P inverse is equal to P transpose, which makes P an orthogonal matrix, right? Which makes P orthogonal, then such matrix decomposition can be written as P D P transpose as well. Okay? And such decompositions are known as orthogonal decompositions. Precisely such decomposition happens because the columns of P are actually orthogonal to each other. Okay, all right, and you know why that happens and when that happens, right? Okay, but to begin with, let's just talk about. So this is just orthogonality, right? I mean, we are. I mean, it, it, we don't really require the columns to be orthonormal to each other. So what is the additional advantage of having an orthonormal basis? Okay, all right. I mean, orthonormal basis is actually what will happen is precisely. I mean, you know that when there is an underdetermined system to solve, right, there is this nasty inverse thing that we have to do, right, A inverse, A, A transpose, A, things like that, right? And so what happens is if your column vectors are not only orthogonal, but also orthonormal, then the middle matrix, A, A transpose, becomes an identity matrix. And that makes things really easy and simple, okay? So having said that, let's just begin, right? So let's say that, you know, let me just start with a simple definition, a basic definition. Let's say that I have a set of vectors, okay? Um, such that, the norm of each one of them is equal to one, okay, right? For all values of i from one to k, right? And so which means all these vectors have length one. All of these vectors have length one, okay? I mean, usually this is too much to expect, but that is why we have to talk about a tool which makes orthogonal vectors orthonormal. So there's a normalization process involved in it. So for most of these cases, there is a normalization process involved, right? There is a normalization process that is involved. Okay, and that normalization process connects us to that tool that I mentioned initially, okay? So if there is a normalization process involved in the sense that suppose you start with a set of orthogonal vectors, you could normalize the set of orthogonal vectors such that the length of each one of them becomes one and, 
and you also have this following identity that works as long as i and j are equal to each other right you have the inner product returning one and if i is not equal to j right then the inner product has to be equal to zero which is the definition for two vectors being perpendicular to each other okay so this is just pairwise orthogonality and so what's the what's the good thing about this the good thing about this is that b if b is an orthonormal set sorry if b is an orthonormal set right we know from previous discussions that the set of vectors in b are linearly independent right we proved this before this is proved before okay and as such b becomes the basis of the vector space and the subspace b is the basis of the subspace since we are talking about the composition of matrices we are naturally talking about the composition of vector spaces into subspaces you have seen that in the eigen value eigen vector discussion right that i can write a vector space as a direct sum of one dimensional subspaces or maybe if not one dimensional subspaces then at least as a direct sum of subspaces whose dimensions are less than the dimension of that vector space itself right and each one of those subspaces if contains an orthonormal basis right then we should be able to write the matrix eventually as a product of the orthogonal decomposition okay all right so then b is the basis of the subspace and therefore what i can say is that b is the b is an orthonormal basis b is an ortho normal basis now onwards whenever i write orthonormal basis i'm going to use this abbreviation omb okay so to give you an example is that let's say i have two vectors v1 okay which are the first one is say 1/3 2/3 and 2/3 okay and i have to cook up another vector which is orthogonal to this right so let's say that is 2/3 1/3 and minus 2 okay so first of all let's check if v1 and v2 are orthogonal to each other right so if the inner product just check the inner product so it's easy to check right 1/3 times 2/3 is um 2 over 9 plus 2 over 9 which is plus 4 over 9 and then minus 4 over 9 so which makes it a b good so this is orthogonal and the to check whether this is ortho normal or not so each one of the vectors its magnitude should be equal to 1 right so norm of b1 square is square root of you know or just take the square root out so it's 1 1 over 9 plus 4 over 9 plus 4 over 9 correct because you are taking the square of each one of these components so that makes it 1 and so therefore this is 1 similarly norm of b2 square is also equal to okay so if v therefore so this this means that v1 v2 are actually or is an orthonormal v1 v2 is orthonormal now if the vector space v is spanned in entirety by these two vectors v1 and v2 then what we can say is that and let's call this as b b is a set of two vectors then we can say that b is an orthonormal basis for the vector space okay 
All right. So at this point of time, I would just like to make a comment. You can consider this as my opinion uh, for now, which is I'll just make a remark, which says that, you know, an orthonormal basis. makes for good coordinate system. Makes for a good coordinate and you can relate this to our previous discussion, our previous discussion on change of basis matrix, okay? Okay, so, uh, I mean, as a, as a, you know, you know, concluding example for this kind of candidates, right? We can say in, if we take Rn, right? Which is the set of real numbers over n dimensions, right? We can say that you know, one, zero, 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 one, and then zero, zero, one is actually an orthonormal. It's a standard basis, but it is also, it is also an orthonormal basis. It's easy to see, right? That it is an orthonormal basis, right? Because each pair is orthogonal to each other and the magnitude of each one of them is also one. Okay, good. And you know how convenient this is. I mean, if you are expressing something in Rn, you can simply use this orthonormal basis and then use the change of basis matrix to go from one particular basis to another particular basis. Okay, so the question is, what is good? Okay. So let's discuss that now. All right, so what is good? So, you know, so let's say there is some vector in the vector space V, and we know if that is the case, then I should be able to express this vector as a linear combination of the spanning set, right? Okay. So I can write this as C1, V1 plus Cn, Vn, right? Where we claim that this V1 to Vn is actually an orthonormal basis, right? And therefore, it is also easy to see that if I do this, which is nothing but C1, V1 plus Cn, Vn, where this Vi is arbitrarily chosen and the value of i is could be anything from one to n, right? Then this will actually turn out to be ci, which is a coefficient, right? I mean, in order to express change of basis matrices, you need coefficients, right? So the point is, I give you some vector, I give you some vector in the vector space, and then we may write a basis. We may write a basis, right? So for some vector in a vector space, so for some x in v, right, what we could do is we may write a basis
you know, such that there is this coefficient matrix times the basis, right, which will give you back the factor. Now, this will exist, this will only exist if, you know, C is inverted. So there is this implicit assumption that C is invertible. We don't know that, right? Now, for an arbitrary basis, right? For an arbitrary basis, this will be a cumbersome thing, right? This is actually a lot of trouble. This will be a lot of trouble if XP is arbitrary, right? On the contrary, on the contrary, right? On the other hand, what I can look at is that if I have something like this, sorry, something like this, which is nothing but these guys, correct? Okay. If I'm able to, you know, express this in the following manner, because you already know what these CIs are, right? You know that this CI, one particular CI for any value of i, is nothing but an inner product of x with those orthogonal vectors, right? So you write your basis in the following manner, and then what you can do is that you change each one of those, right? So inner products are symmetric, you know that, right? So I can write it in the following manner. I can replace C1 with V1 inner product x, and similarly, I can replace CK with a product x. This is good, because inner products are cheap. I mean, unlike the inverse computation, the inner products are really cheap, right? So these are cheap. And so therefore, it's sort of easy as well, correct? So let's take an example, right? Let's take an example. Let's take an example, and that will hopefully uh, help you see what I mean by this, right? So let's say I take a vector, V1, which is three by five. I have to choose these vectors carefully so that they are orthonormal, right? And I have another vector V2, which is negative four over five and three over five. Now it is really easy to see that these are orthogonal to each other. And also each one of these has a length one. So this is, is an orthonormal, right? Okay, and let's also say that the kind of vector space that I am trying to have is spanned by these two vectors only. Okay, so this implies that B is the basis for some subspace, for some subspace of this right okay all right that is we are in r square okay so i I'll, what i'll do is i'll just pick some random number i'll just pick some you know random vector i'll just pick some random vector from the same space r2 right and I'll just say, okay, so let's say I pick this, right? So nine and minus two. And I'll just call this my even arbitrary basis, okay? All right, okay. Now, I mean, if we need to figure out the change of basis matrix, if we need to figure out the change of basis matrix, right? What I, I, I could do is, according to the earlier conjecture, is that I could have my orthonormal basis, you know, these vectors as the columns, right, 3 over 5 and 4 over 5, right, okay? And then minus 4 over 5 um, and 3 over 5, right? So this is the first vector and this is the second vector, right, okay? And then what I'm saying is I'm trying to figure out an arbitrary uh, basis for the change of basis, correct? Okay. And
and this is my nine comma minus two, so that it maps to <coughs> some other vector, right? Okay. So this is in in the normal circumstances. What I have to do if I do not want to use this, what I have to do is that I have to, in order to know what this is. I mean, what change of basis matrix should I, you know, uh, should I have? So that I can go from one basis to another basis, I have to take the inverse of this matrix, right? Now imagine doing this in R to the power 100. Imagine doing this in R to the power 5000, right? Okay. So, but the good part is, so what's the good part, right? So the good part is this. So this is the good part. That instead of solving, instead of solving, you know, for this particular, finding out this particular change of basis matrix, what I can do is I can use the idea that we have, that we obtain from above, right? That this change of basis matrix, since we are in R2, is actually nothing but the inner product of V1X and V2X, then we are done, right? And so, what is V1? I know what is V1, right? V1 is 3, 4 over 5 and 4 over 5. And I know what is that arbitrary X, right? What is that arbitrary X? The arbitrary X is 9 and minus 2. So I take the inner product of it, right? If I do that, actually, let me calculate this. So 3 over 5 times 9 plus 4 over 5 times minus 2 is actually 19 over 3 over 5 times, yes, 19 over 5. Okay? And then again, the inner product of V2 with that, so minus 4 over 5 times 9 minus 3 over, so this will be a minus, minus 36 is minus 42 over 5. Okay, see how easy this is, right? So when we have an orthonormal basis, solving for coordinates of that basis becomes a lot easier, right? So, so actually when we have an orthonormal basis, it is very easy to find coordinates with respect to an orthonormal basis. Okay, all right. So there is the other thing that I will talk about a little bit. I mean, this is the other good part of choosing an orthonormal basis or rather working with an orthonormal basis, right? Which is, this I'm not going to talk a lot about the second part because this second part, what I'm going to talk about, you are already familiar. And also, the second part involves a projection matrix, which uh, we are going to talk about in the next class uh, when I give you some basic idea about how to use a least square optimization uh, technique using the concepts of linear projection. Okay. So, I mean, in general, I'll just tell you this that. Let's say V is a subspace of Rn. Okay. And B is an orthonormal basis. Okay. Which is, you can write it in the following manner. Okay. Then <clears throat> what we can do is that we know for some X which belongs to Rn, right, uh, can be written as an inner product of two vectors, V and W, which is known as a projection vector, right? This is a projection vector of X in the direction of V. We did talk about it when we spoke about inner products, right? In such a manner as that the V belongs to the vector space V and W has to be it belongs to a subspace, which is an orthogonal complement of V, right? Because you have the W vectors, which are actually perpendicular to the V vector. So W has to be a vector, which belongs to an orthogonal complement of V. And we also know that this is a nothing but a linear transformation. Because whatever it is, it is an inner product, right? An inner product is actually nothing but a linear transformation. And then, if we choose a matrix with the columns as these guys, right, then what we know 
is following, then what we know is following is that the projection matrix is A, A transpose A inverse A transpose X. Okay? We have worked this out. But the problem is this is a real pain to compute. This is a real pain. However, if your basis is an orthonormal basis, this becomes really, really easy. Okay? All right? The reason it becomes easy is the following, that once again, what I can do is that because I have split my vector space into two parts, right? One is the orthogonal vector space, and then the other part is the orthogonal complement of the vector space. Then what I know is that X can be written as the sum of this small v and small w. Right? Okay? All right? So in other words, this comes from the fact that my Rn has been split into two subspaces. One is the vector space itself, and the other is the vector space which is complement, orthogonal complement to that vector space. Right? Okay? Such that I can write x as v plus because you know the properties of direct sum, right? Which means that if you pick something, if you pick a vector from here, and you pick a vector from here, and you pick a vector from here, you should be able to write this vector x, right, as an algebraic sum of v and w, right? We also know that there is zero intersection between elements in vector v and elements in vector, you know, v orthogonal complement, right? So we also know that this vector v can be written as p1 v1 as we have already seen plus pk vk plus w, right? And we know that this is nothing but the projection of the vector in the direction of v. Now, if I compute the inner product of x with vi, right? I mean, it is easy to see that I have T1, V1, PK, VK, plus, right? Okay. Now, what happens to this guy? We know that W comes from a vector space, which is orthogonal to each and every component in the vector space V, right? So, W belongs to, and this guy belongs to V. Right? So naturally, if W is orthogonal to each of these VI, so therefore, this will be zero. Right? Okay? And we know from our previous computation that this is nothing but VI. Okay? All right? So if that's the case, then I can actually write my projection vector. I can actually write my projection vector of X, right? Where, which is nothing but uh, this guy, right? Nothing but this guy. But this A is an N by K matrix, right? So this A and this, therefore this A transpose is actually K by N, correct? And so what we have here, so A transpose is um, K by N and A is N by K, right? So uh, therefore what you are going to have is actually a low rank matrix which is k by k, right? So, and since these are orthogonal to each other, because what is A? A is this, and this is what? This forms the orthonormal basis, right? So when you multiply this A with the A transpose, you are going to get like V1 squared, V2 squared, VK squared along the principal diagonal, and every other element, right? The off-diagonal entries are going to be zero because those will be what? V1 in a product V2, V1 in a dot product V3, so on and so forth, right? So this A transpose A will become a K by K matrix, okay? So what you have is A, I, K by K, A transpose, okay? So this, what this does for us is that it saves us a lot of work. It saves us a lot of work because this notorious thingy, because if A transpose A is a K by K, its inverse is also going to be a K by K, and this is nothing but an actually an identity matrix. So computing the inverse is really easy, right? You are actually do not you are not computing anything, 
So this becomes achieved. So therefore, what happens is no need to compute the inverse. So if the projection is easy to find, and the reason that you are able to find the projection so easily is because you have used an orthonormal basis. Okay. Now, so these are the two good things of why we should care about an orthonormal basis. Now, once so therefore now the bottom line is that once we know what these when these are for the next question is how to use them. In practice. Okay, so the question that I want to ask, or the question that I want to address, is the following: that given a set of orthogonal vectors only, given a set of orthogonal vectors only, how is there an way? Is there an algorithmic way to translate the set of orthogonal vectors to a set of orthonormal vectors? Okay, so is there an algorithm? Is there an algorithm? Or a method right to translate orthogonal guys to orthonormal and it turns out that the tool I was mentioning in the beginning of the lecture actually helps us do it. Okay, all right. Okay. We also know that orthogonal matrices preserve angles and lengths, so this is nice. So, so the, now the question is given, now the question is given a basis, just a basis, right? Okay, can we generate an orthonormal basis? This is the question. Okay. So let's begin with some basis. Okay. So this is some basis on P. Okay. And this would be an incremental approach or rather than, you know, uh, right. So, so let us just consider, so we, I'll just consider V1, which is nothing but a one dimensional subspace of P. So I'll just consider V1, which is nothing but a one dimensional subspace of. Okay, all right. And so therefore, I mean, since this is a one dimensional subspace of V, all I could expect in that particular subspace is just one vector, right? This is a span of V1. So assuming that this V1 spans the vector space, capital V1, right? And let's say to begin with that this particular guy is not orthonormal in the sense that, you know, this is just one vector, right? So since I have only one vector, the only thing that I need to worry is to how to make this normal one, right? I have to normalize it. So how do I normalize this, right? So the normalization process is the following, is that I create another vector, u1, which is nothing but v1 by norm of if I do this, then the next step when I compute the norm of U1 is what? Nothing but the norm of V1 by norm of V1. Okay, all right. And then since this norm of V1 is a scalar, it just constitutes a length, right? I can pull it out. 
So this is just norm of V1. And what remains inside is also norm of V1. And therefore, I cancel this out. And this becomes 1. OK? All right? So if you have just one vector, then it is easy to do it. And you can say that U1 and is a non -season. Since U1 is already a basis, right? And it is also normalized. And since this is just one vector, you can say that U1 is an orthonormal basis for V1, the one-dimensional subspace. Now, let's consider V2. I have to be able to do it for all vectors, right? In fact, over the entire vector space, which is n-dimensional. Now, this V2 is a two-dimensional subspace of V. And since this is two-dimensional, what I could, I must have is that two vectors, V1 and V2, which are orthogonal to each other, right? Okay. And this is nothing but since I have already converted my V1 to a U1, right? I mean, this will be equal, equivalent to span of U1, comma, V2. Okay. All right. Since U1 is nothing but a linear combination of just a scalar multiple of V1, right? But the question is, is this orthonormal? Okay? All right. So let's see. So what I have here is that, just consider this. What I have here is some vector V1 in this direction, right? Okay? All right. And also what I have here is some scalar, some scalar combination of V1 is nothing but U1, right? Okay. So this is like in this direction, I have U1. Okay. All right. And let's say the V2 vector is in this direction, right? Okay. And in order to sort of guarantee orthogonality, I need to drop a perpendicular, right? And let me call this as y2, right? And this length, let me call it as x. Okay, all right. Now, this y2, this y2 guy has to be a member of the vector space, which is orthogonal to v1, right? So this has to be, this y2 has to be a member of the vector space, which is orthogonal to the complement of that vector space V1, isn't it? Because this U1 is in this direction and we know that U1 is a member of the vector space V1, right? Okay. Now, how are we going to, you know, compute this X or Y2 or whatever? Now, V2 is linearly independent of V1, right? Because that's the way we frame this out, right? Because this is already a basis, right? We know that this is a basis, but we don't know whether, whether this is an orthonormal basis or not. So V2 is what V2 is, that V2 is linearly independent of V1, okay? Now, if we want to construct an orthonormal basis, because this is what our goal, right? What we want to construct is an orthonormal basis U1, V2, right? So we want to construct an orthonormal basis, U1 and V2, right? So we need an orthogonal vector to V1, correct? And that is exactly what we have done. So therefore, there is some vector which is a member of the orthogonal complement, and that vector is nothing but the Y2 vector, right? And from the triangle inequality now, from the triangle inequality now, so therefore, from the triangle inequality, sorry, from the triangle law, what I have is that, sorry, what I have is that V2 is nothing but X plus Y2, right? Where X is in the one-dimensional vector space V1 and Y2 is in the one-dimensional vector space V1 orthogonal complement, right? And so therefore, what I have here is Y2, which is nothing but v2 minus x. Now, what is x? This x is nothing but the projection of the vector v2 in the direction of uh, v1, right? So, this is nothing but the projection of 
the vector v2 in the direction of v1 right okay and we also know that v1 already has an orthonormal basis we know that so v1 has an orthonormal basis because it has only one vector right and so therefore the span of u1 comma v2 is nothing but the span of u1 and v2 okay all right so now what we need to do is to be able to express or to is to be able to compute this projection right okay so by definition by definition the projection of v2 in the direction of v1 is nothing but the inner product of v2 in u1 because u1 is in the direction of v1 times u1 okay all right so using this i should be able to compute y2 right so therefore let me do it here itself so so therefore y2 is v2 minus projection of this and this projection is nothing but v2 u1 comma u1 okay now this is how you guarantee that your y2 is actually perpendicular to u1 right so you have started with a basis of u1 v2 you wanted to make sure that this basis becomes orthonormal so therefore you had to cook up some orthogonal component of it and it turns out that orthogonal component is y2 so therefore instead of looking at u1 comma v2 what you are looking at is now u1 comma y2 which is fine so you have to ensure that u1 comma y2 is an orthonormal basis and by construction this is indeed an orthogonal but not yet orthonormal so what do you need to do in order to make this orthonormal you have to define u2 which is nothing but y2 over the norm of y2 okay and so therefore once you do that you ensure that u1 and u2 are by construction orthogonal to each other and the way you normalize the stuff that u1 and u2 they are also orthogonal and so therefore what you have now is that you have a set of vectors u1 and u2 in v2 which is a two dimensional subspace of the vector space v and this indeed becomes an orthonormal basis and we got to extend this out right so we have to extend this out so if we extend this out in the three dimensional subspace so i will just do it in the next slide right because otherwise this becomes too clumsy okay <clears throat> So now we take the V3, which is nothing but a three-dimensional subspace. Now it's a three-dimensional subspace of V. And so therefore, I mean the span of this has to be three vectors, and we need to ensure that these three vectors are. Now the previous two vectors are U1 and U2, mind it, right? And the third one is V3. And then what we need to do is we need to be able to compute the projection of v3 in the direction of v1 and v2 right and that will be actually a three dimensional projection of a v3 which is a three dimensional subspace in using two dimensions and therefore what we need is a two inner product which is you have to project the vector v3 in the direction of u1 right which is the first component and then you have to project the vector v3 in the direction of u2 which is the second component right okay and then you got to compute y3 which is nothing but v3 minus projection of v3 in the direction of v2 right and then we normalize y3 in the following manner y3 over norm of y3 and the process so on okay so what you will do is and this is actually known as this entire process is known as 
gram met ortho normalization process. Okay, all right. So, if you really have to, you know, sort of, so I mean, you can easily see an algorithmic structure, right? I mean, you can so initialize, you know, initialize V, right? Right, and then it's pretty simple, right? I mean, your DJ is, uh, you have to compute your YJ. So your yj is nothing but vj minus projection of vj, vj minus 1, right? Okay. And then you update, then you compute uj, which is yj over norm of yj, right? And you do this inside the for loop for j equal to 2 to n minus 2 to n, right? We do it inside the for loop and that's it. Okay. So you have an algorithmic structure. So the whole point is, given any basis, given any basis, right? If those bases are, if those basis vectors are orthogonal to each other, right? You can construct an orthonormal basis out of it, so that a lot of your things, computations, including projection, computing inverses, computing least square optimization, all these problems you are easy to solve. Okay. So a very quick example of how Gram-Smith works. Is the following that a very quick example is that let's say V is a plane, V is a plane spanned by x1 plus x2 plus x3 equal to zero. Right? So, can you construct an orthonormal basis in this particular plane? Right? So what turns out that it's easy to see that I have, I can express this x1 as minus x2 minus x3, right? And so therefore, if I think about v as being spanned by these guys, then this x1 can be represented in terms of minus x2 minus x3, x2 and x3. So you have two basis vectors, x2 is minus one, one, zero, right? Uh, sorry, plus x3 is minus one, zero, one, right? Easy to see that these two are linearly independent of each other, right? Because here the position of zero is different. And also it's easy to see that, uh, are these, uh, okay, hang on, did I, minus one, minus one, zero, one, right? Okay. But this is linearly independent, right? But they are not orthonormal. They're not orthonormal. You can see it because if you take the inner product of these two vectors, minus 1, 1, 0, and minus 1, 0, 1, you can see that the dot product is not 0. The inner product is not 0. However, for a, for a plane, which is nothing but a two-dimensional you know, subspace, right, the basis vectors will suffice. So these two will span V. There is no doubt about this, right? So these two guys will span so what you have to do is that you have to make these ortho normal, right? So, and the process of ortho normalization includes orthogonalization as well, right? So your V1, so you first start with V1. So let's call this V1 and let's call this V2. So what is V1 is that you first compute the norm of V1. V1 is what? Minus one, one, zero. So its norm is nothing but square root of two, okay? So, and so therefore, you know how to normalize the vector. So your u1 will be 1 over square root of 2 minus 1, 1, and 0, right? Okay? So now, and you, you, can, you can think of a one-dimensional subspace of V, which is V1, which is easily spanned by this, right? Okay? And then the other work is V2. Now, V2 is, when we go to V2, is nothing but a span of, v1 and v2 which is nothing but the span of 
u1 and v2 because u1 is just a scalar multiple of v1 right and so therefore you have to compute y2 y2 is what y2 is nothing but v2 minus projection of v2 in the direction of v1 right and that will be nothing but the inner product of v2 with u1 times u1 right so i'll just do it here so the projection of v2 in the direction of v1 right is nothing but the inner product of v2 with u1 times u1 right and so this is this is really easy right i mean you you know how to compute the inner product of v2 with u1 and when you update it using the rule your y2 is nothing but u2 v2 minus and what is v2 v2 is minus 1 0 1 minus the inner product of these two now the inner product of these two you know what is v2 you know what is u1 right okay so you just take the inner product of this and then multiply it with u1 and once you do all that simplification right what you will find out is that your y2 is nothing but minus 1 half minus 1 half and 1 okay so this is your y2 what is your u1 your u1 is 1 over square root of 2 minus 1 1 and 0 now you look at the inner product of y2 and u1 you will see that these are now orthogonal to each other but still yet this y2 does not have length 1 so what do you do you do a normalization which is y2 over norm of y2 okay so if you do that it will turn out to be square root of 2 by 3 minus 1 half minus 1 half and 1 and you know what is your u1 now you check for yourself whether so both of these are actually normal normalized to length 1 and if you take the inner product of u1 and u2 you will see that the inner product of u1 and u2 will be zero okay will be zero so this is how starting from any basis you can actually create an orthonormal basis and then later use it in your change of basis computation okay so that brings us to the uh, you know end of and this gram split orthonormalization technique is a very very useful tool because it eventually saves us a lot of computation as i was explaining uh, in the beginning of the lecture when i was giving the motivation behind creating an orthonormal basis okay so in the next class what we are going to do is that we will extend the idea of projection operation and use it to solve a very interesting problem i'll just give you a brief very brief idea of what we are going to do in the next class is that from a geometric point of view if you have a two dimensional coordinate system and if you have a sort of um or rather like this straight lines we actually do not have a mutual point of intersection but some straight lines intersect with each other but not all of the straight lines intersect at one point if you still want to find out the closest point where all of these straight lines come almost close to each other so that closest point if you want to find out because obviously you cannot find out by using a your matrix system because this is an actually this particular system of equations if you if you draw out does not have a solution does not have an exact solution so what do you need to do you need to compute an approximate solution to this sort of system of equation and that sort of approximation is solved by this projection operation also known as least square method or least square optimization so this is what we are going to talk about in the next class
all right see you in the next class